um, I'm, so I'm Linda Monkson, I'm Head of Communities Research, and um, I got bored late last night, so I started doing my, my wall montage, as I was thinking about heritage values. Um, I want to start, I, I'm kind of assuming, actually I should quite like to know, who wants to know who Historic England is, or are you all really au okay fait with it? Because I really don't want to talk about it, if you all know exactly what we do and who we are. But if anybody goes, I don't really get it since you changed your name, then I will very happily. So hands up if you'd love to know what we do. <laughs> not you. <laughs> not you. <laughs> not you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Only the people that work for it want to know. Excellent. That's not a very good sign, is it? Anyway, this is what we officially do. But I won't. I mean, so I'm sure you know that we do um, recommendations for listing and planning advice and strategic research and lots of other things. But I will, um, you can ask any of my Historic England colleagues, <laughs> current or ex, who I can see in the room, <laughs> if you want to know more. Brilliant, that saves me a good four minutes. This is what I want to talk about in the next kind of, um, well, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, I think the disclaimer bit is simply that whilst I've officially called my paper an institutional perspective, um, on heritage values. I'm not actually speaking as Historic England officially. I'm speaking as someone, like I suspect my <coughs> colleagues are speaking, which is somebody who's worked in the organisation for, in my case, about 13 years. And uh, these are basically the voices in my head, not an official statement of Historic England policy or belief. So I thought it was important to say that at the beginning, but I'm guessing that most of us are talking about that today. But for me, as somebody that's never been to TAG before, and I normally speak at official Historic England events, I might say different things today than the ones that I would say at official Historic England events. Um, I wanted to start off by saying a little tiny bit about why I wanted to arrange the session. And I don't know, because I've not done TAG before, I don't know whether that's normally how people start. But mostly, it was out of curiosity. So, I... <laughs> You're right. I, I make an entrance. Um, I think in all the reading that I've done over the past 10 or so years, having worked um, both as a researcher and in strategic research, I get really frustrated between the, the, the way that policy and practice and theory are dealt with. And I also find that within Historic England, um, there are... How can I put this? Sometimes people think I'm too academic for what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know if anybody else ever feels like that inside Stroke England. Um, but probably outside and in academia, I look too much like a practitioner to be properly theoretical. So for me, there's a sort of dilemma between the two states of being. And in all the books, especially the ones that have titles saying philosophy, practice and policy, I then, as a practitioner, if you like, get frustrated that they never really address the policy side. They just seem to say, this theory is complicated and difficult and we don't know how to apply it to practice. But they never really quite get into understand the practice enough to understand why some of the things they're saying are difficult to implement. So I think um, what was in my head in trying to pull this together was simply to try to understand both the different perspectives that sit within Historic England and the different perspectives between practice and policy and theory that sit in the kind of non-heritage professional sector, in the more uh, university-based sector. So most of this is just a selfish action to hear what you're all going to say and get a better handle on how I think, from a strategic research point of view, we at Historic England should deal with the issue of multiple values and the kinds of policy work that we do. Um, and I'm also aware, even though I haven't met him, that John, at the, who's my last speaker, sort of bookend speaker, is almost likely going to contradict everything that I'm going to say. <laughs> in, and I understand good tag tradition. So, um, so I guess what I'm trying to say at the beginning is that is this where historic England sits? Do we sit between an inevitable rock and hard place, between an authorised heritage discourse and the fact that it's all big and complicated and multiple on the other side? And if we do is our role to improve ourselves and make us a little bit more comfortable, but accept that this is where we sit, or should we just not really bother and just get on with what we do and be chilled, like my unicorn? <laughs> so that's, part, that's the sort of background, I guess, to what I'm, how I'm framing this session. So this is the kind of voices in my head section, and I decided the best way for me to construct this was to look back at why I, what I said in the original call for papers, 
um, and then work out what I think are the assumptions that we commonly make about heritage. Some of these are not very new. I'm just saying that I think these are ones that have got particular resonance in the organisation at the moment. So I'm just going to go through each one of these really quickly and then at the end of each one of them I have a kind of question that I've set myself, I suppose, as part of this session. Um, uh, no, I'll stay here for a minute, sorry. So heritage is a socially constructed process and the historic environment is an entity. And I know that that kind of uh, sounds obvious, but... Um, sorry, I'm just... Sorry, I'm just getting confused because the printer's done something slightly strange. So many people have written about the fact that heritage is constructed through negotiation as a process, not a thing, and that it's intrinsically dissonant. Some people have stated that historic environment as a term has been used increasingly in the last few years to mask the complexity of heritage and identify it with a thing rather than a process so, so that we can avoid the complexity of talking about it as a process. And it's even been suggested that this has been a conscious decision within organisations such as Historic England. This perceived shift towards single objective concepts reinforces the static nature of heritage. For us as a national body with national responsibilities, there is almost inevitably a constant reinforcement, which it's claimed relates strongly to national identity and belonging, of the permanence of heritage and its values. The only movement in us as an organisation, arguably, is gradually moving towards a better representation of national identity, itself presented as an unchanging concept created by tradition. Our ability to consider the complexities of multiple values associated with objects and places that we designate or we recommend are designated as special, I know we're going to be covered in some of the papers that follow, and I, and I know some of them are going to talk about unanticipated conflict within heritage as well as kind of known and understood ones. So my kind of question about this topic is really how do we reconcile the fact that as a process heritage isn't fixed and changes across time with a system of heritage identification and protection that is described as essentialist, immutable and outcomes orientated. So moving on to social inclusion is positive. Um, and when I say these assumptions, I'm not saying I don't believe social inclusion is positive, but I think this is how we always <coughs> talk about heritage, um, particularly at a really high level, political rhetorical level. Um, so we often talk about better representation of the national heritage being done through a lens of the social inclusion agenda even though we know that selection by definition means exclusion, and we could talk about that for days, which I won't. Um, but uh, current discourse associates belonging in a sense of collective identity with the local or national as roots to achieve social inclusion. And then there's another step which takes it from social inclusion to community cohesion. So embedded into government discourse in the early part of this century, as part of the backlash to the multiculturalism debate, there are two statements, and I could have done this as a quiz, which one was said by David Cameron and which one was said by Gordon Brown. So one of them said, we need to strengthen our collective identity, and the other one said, we have overemphasised our separateness at the cost of unity. And they are, uh, I don't even know which way around they are, Cameron must have said we need to strengthen our collective identity, and Gordon Brown said we've overemphasised our separateness at the cost of unity, and this was in about 2007 and eight, and they sound very similar. Um, I think what comes out of this is that the concept of unity and cohesiveness politically um, are seen as a solution to the failure of multiculturalism, leading to a promotion of integration and assimilation socially and politically. If you marry that up with a notion that was expressed by a previous chairman of our organisation when we were called English Heritage, um, that heritage is the nation's soul, it seems that heritage creation and its impact is inevitably drawn into this kind of political process about how we use heritage and how we address the issues of social inclusion and its positive benefits. As early as 94, Stuart Hall, 1994, Stuart Hall said social inclusion has become a process that is inevitably destructive and exclusionary. So I suppose the questions are about how we get a balance to that kind of um, comment. The heritage profession has been accused of implementing a social inclusion agenda in a way that encourages marginalised groups to see the truth in inverse commas, that is, attempting to get some kind of social or community consensus through heritage recognition. It's the sort of shared values agenda. It has simply been bringing everyone into, um, into a sense of normal, even though normal is still defined by the ex existing dominant class. And this is my understanding, at least, of the kind of rhetoric that surrounds the way that we do social inclusion. Emma Waterton's statement um, that many of us may agree with, I suppose, is that any idea of heritage is always operating against a range of alternative perspectives. So
So how do we reconcile this with the nature of a selection process that we operate within, which constitutes this immutable single perspective heritage idea? Now, Historic England advocates the use of its, I don't know when it was um, announced, six, 12 months ago, somebody will know, enriching the list, where members of the public can go and make their own comments about buildings that are on the list. <coughs> and in many ways, this is seen as a really big step towards gaining insight into multiple perspectives on buildings and adding information to it. Despite what is probably difficult from outside the organisation to realise, that there must have been quite a big conceptual sh shift internally to even enable that to happen. Even accepting that, an, an alternative way of looking at it might be to argue that it's a bit of a smokescreen. So whilst it's claimed to open up an aspect of the authorised discourse to different voices, it can never really truly radically change what we do, as it applies only to those aspects of the built environment which have already been identified as heritage. So my question at the end of this session, this uh, section, is so in the same way as the social inclusion agenda has been said to mask the inherent exclusive characteristics of heritage, does the planning and conservation legislation that we work under, the late 20th century legislation, act as a convenient barrier between us and critical heritage discourse ambitions? Uh, my third point is about heritage is transformative and this is a really big issue for us at the moment because we're uh, working a lot more on issues around well-being than we have been previously. The concept of heritage as a good cause isn't new and I don't need to document the whole thing for you and it's embedded in things like the Faroe Convention um, and uh, a lot of the new Labour documents <coughs> from the late 90s because they had as their own public service agreement a goal to build cohesive and powered and active communities and as a direct result of that part of the public service agreement, our funding um, government department, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, was charged with increasing participation in heritage. So what they thought social inclusion meant and improvement in quality of life meant was whether you visited a heritage site. Um, and that's because that was the only thing that they could really measure at that time. Um, and so social inclusion was seen really as an issue of engagement. <coughs> Um, and if you engage in heritage and you see the value of heritage, then you will automatically become happier because you will then belong and you will live happily ever after. And this is actually what sits behind a much older concept, which is the heritage cycle, which um, explains to people that if they just understand what's important about the historic environment, they will automatically value it, care for it and enjoy it. And um, we don't use this much now, I don't think, although it still exists in principle, and whilst I don't have time to talk about this, I'm going to just show it for 10 seconds anyway. I've been playing around with what happens if you just had a totally different language approach to something like the heritage cycle, and would it make any difference to how people perceived us as an organisation? So one of the most obvious things at the moment might be to look at the five ways of well-being and wonder what a heritage cycle would look like if you based it on a well-being cycle rather than a value cycle. So uh, we haven't adopted this, this is just the voices in my head, but it <laughs> doesn't mean I won't push it out there occasionally. But as you'll see uh, from the slide, it's just this idea of slightly shifting our perspective um, and seeing whether that's how we need to adapt to this idea about heritage being um, transformative. The, the problem in some ways is that heritage is now seen, and cultural heritage generally, now seems to carry this responsibility to solve social ills um, and promote intercultural dialogue. Um, the government white paper on culture mentions well-being 22 times uh, in relation to the power of the cultural heritage. It is an enabler of good things and a deliverer of social benefits. This appears to mean that it is credited with providing a safe place in which difference can be discussed and a safe place where cohesion can be created. And that seems to me to be the underlying principle that, that is accepted by that approach to the transformative qualities of heritage. <coughs> now, the concept of public value of heritage was given a good airing in a conference paper between government and us and others in 1999, which was published. Um, and this isn't from that, actually. This is from a heritage counselling that we did later on. But this idea about how you divide up the different kinds of value of heritage is still under current debate. And Historic England is currently consulting on the development of a new public value framework which will respond to all of this um, literature. Um, and I suppose one of the problems is that the generality of the way the government and official documents talk about heritage is that they never articulate the causal links between things like value, well-being, impact and heritage. It's just an assumed position and 
that in itself raises lots of questions about how you measure impact and what impact measurement is and how you should know it all from the beginning. And this is my favourite impact <laughs> slide. <laughs> this is how I feel quite a lot of work. <laughs> um, and I, uh, one of the things that's quite interesting is that I've recently had translated a Swedish document that was written by the Swedish National Heritage Board, which we are going to publish as soon as I've got their corrections back through for the document. And it's actually a document that's trying to persuade the Swedish government to sign and ratify the Faroe Convention, clearly not something which our government has got at the top of its agenda right now or ever. But, the, but one of the things that's interesting about this document to me is that, is that they have to set out what they think the risks are to the government in signing something. And it talks about how it feels that despite recommending signing the Faroe Convention and adopting that connection between human rights and cultural heritage, that its visions are too ambitious. It contains the hope that the use of cultural heritage will solve a wide range of social problems. There is also a risk of relying on the ability of cultural heritage to serve the community in a functional way. Uh, there are other issues. I mean, we will publish it on our website eventually, in, one, in the not-too-distant future, actually, so it will all be up there. But I think this idea of how we reconcile the stated and highly generalised need to demonstrate the public value of heritage through addressing inequalities, cohesion, well-being, with the complexity of the specificity of identifying heritage is really difficult for us as an organisation. And as most of those words are in my own job description, which was written for January of this year, I find it quite interesting that, that my job description is the end of that kind of thread of thinking that's ended up in a place that now has it embedded in how we approach heritage and cultural heritage. So my fourth um, sort of paragraph, if you like, which was the future is where you want to go and fast. When people talk about time and the relationship between past and present, separated, sorry, between past and future, otherwise it doesn't make sense, <laughs> separated as it is by the present, it often comes, well, I, I say it often comes across, what I actually mean is the voices in my head picture it like this, that there's a kind of rectangle, which is the future, and a rectangle in the middle that's about the same size as the present, and a rectangle over there that's the past. <coughs> And, the, the, prob and the, the, the rectangle in the middle that's the present, you can all tell me this is rubbish, um, I believe in the way that it's written about often seems to accommodate the idea of modernity as this sort of big long space of time that sits between the past and the present. And I trained as a medievalist originally, which is probably why I really like the way that St Augustine thought about it, um, which was much more to do with this idea of the present being a fine line that enables the transition from past to present. And um, I think that... I suppose I'm saying this thing about time because I don't know if the ancient Greeks really thought this, but um, I did find a reference to this somewhere, so I apologise if it was some kind of internet joke, but I quite like it anyway. This idea that we look, at, we look at the future as if it's in front of us and the past as if it's behind us, but if you looked at the past as if it's in front of you because it's the stuff that you can see, and the future is the stuff that's behind you because you can't see it, and the present, not as this big long time of contemporary modernity that we talk about all the time, then I just wondered whether there'd be a kind of shift in how we perceive the importance of the future. And I guess I'm, it's very difficult at work to say any of this in a way that would translate into, into practice, which is why I came here to say it. But um, I just wonder whether it would, it would shift how we think about it. So if we spent more time thinking about at the moment, we, talk, we, we spend more time thinking about where we're going. And heritage is thought is, is itself is a future-creating process. We, all the literature, not all the literature, sorry, apologies to those present, but a lot of the literature does talk about um, the fact that we're creating this so that the future understands how important the past was and how wonderful it was and how interesting it is and how we've selected <coughs> stuff. But, of course, it doesn't really do that. So it seems to me the question is that if time is more about memory and perception and seeing where we've been, and the present is not a duration but a transient moment, surely we could be clearer on our role of enabling the future to understand how we understood the past, rather than claim that we're just demonstrating what the past was. I have no idea if any of that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense inside my head. But um, anyway, so that's kind of my fourth question. I did, in my inimitable way, assume I had time to talk all about social inclusion and its difficulties, but I think I'm not going to do that. Um, I just want to make sure that I have mentioned some <coughs> of the projects which would be considered social inclusion projects that we've done at work, um, which are different in nature. So I'm not going to talk about them in detail, but um, Pride of Place and Disability in Time and Place, which were run by our social inclusion team, who are completely brilliant in all respects. Um, 
And they did genuinely, there were some listing recommendations, <coughs> but they did genuinely try to engage people in saying, where are the places that you think are valuable and where are they important? So one might argue the most important product of this kind of project isn't necessarily what comes out into the authorised territory discourse, the list at the end, but what happens um, on the way, if you like, that the process of the project is more important than the outcomes. We've done a lot of work on faith heritage, which I was leading on um, for a number of years, where we have focused specifically on different faith groups that have been properly, we believe have been underrepresented in the um, in the list and in the discourse of heritage, and we will be publishing the book on the British Mosque um, <coughs> in March next year. But most of the other things, if you Googled them, are available online already. Uh, so I just wanted to flag up that that we were doing that. I think the only thing I would just like to say before I conclude is that that this idea that heritage is about unity that I've tried to explain, I thought it was really interesting that when we did the slave trade, uh, we did work on the British country house and the slave trade, and we had our own messages about you know, trying to articulate different kinds of histories. But some of the government rhetoric on it when it was launched, and other people were doing things at the same time, it wasn't just referring to us and our project, it was the whole um, kind of abolition um, kind of anniversary. They seem to use it as a way to say that heritage and cohesion exist as a result of us saying, oh look, but we're wonderful now, British cultural values aren't like this anymore, this is where we are now. And it almost hides the idea that it is inherently a very contested place. And I think there's something invidious about that idea that you're using heritage as something which is always clean and good mm -hmm. and helpful. Um, even though, as an organisation, inevitably, we, you know, we, can, we can struggle, as I said at the beginning, in being between that kind of rock and that hard place. Um, it comes out, and I won't go into it, Cecil Rhodes, you've all heard about him. Um, the only thing that did, one of our directors said this the other day, actually, is it is a weird world where we end up saying very similar things to Donald Trump about statues, even if for different reasons. Because if you read some of the letters in The Times and Telegraph and things that have been said by official organisations, they're terrifyingly similar to what Donald Trump said about Charlottesville, when he basically said, um, it'll be George Washington next week, Thomas Jefferson the week after, you have to ask yourself, where does it all stop? And if you just replace the names, then I've got a direct quote from the Times that says almost the same thing. And I never really believed we'd be quite that close to his, his own rhetoric. The only thing to add to this is that, um, that we're so focused on, <coughs> well, the Confederate history of the States and the colonial history in this country, that we forget that people like Bomber Harris and Oliver Cromwell themselves and almost everybody out there do have complex histories. And I know we don't, probably in this room, but the media certainly does and the government certainly does. So, um, so I'm going to end now by uh, two slides, I think. One, where, where are we now? And I, I don't know if this is terribly helpful. I feel working in the organisation I do, there is no way, there is no one agreed way to deal with any of this complexity, and we need to decide whether we need one way of dealing with it or whether we just carry on, as I said at the beginning. And that it will probably always remain quite confusing in the context of an organisation which has the kind of remit that our organisation has, certainly in terms of its public facing delivery. So its most public delivery probably is the list, even though it's a tiny fraction of the work that all of us do. Um, and then that we talk a lot about the, the principles, like the Ferry Convention does, about the heritage of the everyday. But how much are we as an organisation trying to really radically shift anything um, and listen to other people's perspectives? Um, I suppose that's kind of where I think we are, but my colleagues may um, disagree with me, of course. So I've got some questions that I'm asking kind of myself, I suppose, and if we want to discuss them in any of the discussion sessions, we can, but if the discussion <coughs> sessions take a different turn, mm -hmm. that's fine. But the questions for what they're worth are, if Historic England and the Authorised Heritage Discourse presents one way of seeing rather than multiple ways of seeing, how can we, if we should, be reconciling or improving this? Do organise, this one really irritates, this worries me actually, but do organisations such as ours become or are we already part of a culture of social assimilation, um, almost by accident? And what steps, if any, should um, or would we need to take to address it? And then the third one really relates to our role as the government's advisor on the historic environment, which is how could we influence government in having a more nuanced approach to heritage? And um, that's me. So um, thank you very much. And we will now move on to the other speakers, and then we're going to have a discussion session at the end. Jonathan, do you want to just uh, yeah. order my voice already? Thank you. Thank you.